Well, I want to begin by just greeting those that are Kesslinger campus who are joining us, uh, watching this uh, this morning. We're glad that you're with us. We're finishing up a little mini-series inside the series with Jesus on eating with Jesus, meals with Jesus. How many of you ever played the game and been asked the question, maybe on a survey or the kind of question you ask when you're on a long drive? If you could have a meal with anyone in history, who would you have that meal with? You ever played that game? You ever had someone ask you that question? What would you say? Last night, a guy yelled out, Chuck Norris, which kind of threw me off. Wasn't <laughs> expecting that. I'm like, really? Anyone in history, that's who you choose? Who would you choose? I know, I know we're in church, and so you're tempted to say Jesus. Okay, granted. Jesus aside, who else would you choose? Gandhi. <laughs> Gandhi, interesting. Now, if I flip the question around and said, who in history would you least like to have a meal with? How would you? <laughs> you know, I, the person we're going to look at here in the account in John chapter 21, I think the answer to Peter after the crucifixion and resurrection would likely have been the same. The person he most desperately wanted to see and most feared meeting had the most anxiety about would have been Jesus, his Lord and his master. Our theme with Jesus in our series, uh, which will take us right up to Advent, when Jesus calls someone to follow him, it's not a nine to five thing, it's not a sometime thing. He doesn't say, follow me and we'll do this thing, then go back to your life and I'll see you tomorrow around noon. He says, come be with me. To follow Jesus is to be with him. And what does that mean for us in our context to be with him, to live our lives with him? And we've been examining what it means to eat with Jesus and who Jesus ate with, which might seem like a strange thing to study. But there's a lot of wisdom and relevance for us in who Jesus ate with. In fact, Jesus was regularly in trouble for eating with the wrong people, tax collectors and sinners. And we should thank God that he did. In fact, the heart of this little mini-series inside the theme with Jesus comes to us from Revelation 3, verse 20. And I think many of you will know this passage It'll be familiar to you. Jesus here speaking. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. You ever stop to think, why does Jesus, he could just say, I will come in and reside in your heart. He could just say, I'll come in and forgive your sin. I will come in and uh, clean up your life. I'll come in and be with you. Why does he say, and eat with him? Why eat? Because in the Biblical worldview, in Jesus' day, it's not so much in our day, but in Jesus' day, to eat with someone was a profound message of acceptance, peace, fellowship. Jesus says, I'll come in and we'll sit down together over a table and share a meal. A powerful, symbolic way of saying, you'll be with me. I accept you. We're together. In our culture, table fellowship doesn't have, we eat in our cars. We eat in a hurry. But in Jesus' day, that's why he says this. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and we'll sit down at the table. This is the heart of the gospel. To invite Jesus into the center of your heart and life, to know the transforming grace of his love and forgiveness. And this is the heart of the story of Peter we're going to study here this morning. If you have your Bible open to John chapter 21, we'll read the first 14 verses to start. A little context now. This is after the crucifixion and the resurrection. Jesus tells his disciples to go into Galilee and wait for him, and he doesn't show up right away. We pick up the story here. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. By the way, Tiberias also is Galilee. It was named Tiberias because Tiberius Caesar established a town on the shores of the, of the lake. Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, and Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. And they said, we'll go with you. And they went out and got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? They answered him, no. Cast the net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. So they cast it. Now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. 
The disciple whom Jesus loved, therefore, said to Peter, It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work, and threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from land, but about a hundred yards off. When they got on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid out on it and bread. And Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared ask him, Who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and so with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. A couple things about this story. Uh, just to point out as kind of an aside, sometimes people doubt the validity of the gospel accounts. They wonder if they're historically reliable, if you can count on them, or if they're revisionist history, or if they're just myths and legends. Among many evidences, there's some interesting things in this account that give us real reason to trust the validity of the, of the gospel accounts. For example, some of the details in there. 153 fish, did you notice that? Why 153? Well, if, if the Gospels are myths and legends, then the number should be symbolic, and scholars have debated for years, what's the symbolism of 153? We know about 12, we know about 10, we know about 3, we know about 70. What's the, what does 153 symbolize? Would you like to know? I know what it means. Would you like me to tell you? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. You know why there's 153? Because they're fishermen, and they count. They count the fish. It matters to them, and they put it, recorded it. James and John were fishermen. They were in business, actually, with Peter as a fisherman, and they counted. You know what else is interesting? It says that Peter put on his outer garment to jump in the water. Does that strike you as odd? Don't you usually take off your shirt or, or coat to get in the water? He was stripped down to his undergarment for work on the boat, but he puts on his garment to jump in the water. That's weird. Why would he do that, and why include that unless it actually happened? Some have said, well, these are details that the authors added to make it seem like it's realistic. But modern realistic fiction didn't exist for centuries. Listen to what C.S. Lewis writes about this. Modern fiction includes lots of details to give an air of reality. Ancient myths and legends do not. I've been reading poems, romances, myths, and legends all my life. I know what they're like, and I know that none of them are like this. Of the gospel accounts, there are only two options. They are either reportage or else some ancient unknown writer without predecessor or successor suddenly anticipated the whole technique of modern realistic fiction by hundreds of years. His point is you can, you can rely on this. It's in there because it happened. Now Jesus had already appeared, as we said, to his disciples. He'd already appeared to them. He told them, go into Galilee and wait for me. And he doesn't show for a while. And Peter gets impatient. And he says, I'm going fishing. And the disciple says, well, we'll go too. Now, we're tempted to think that's something like, you know, I'm going to do something to pass the time, like a pole with a bobber and a worm, just sit on the bank and fish. That's not what he's doing. This is a major undertaking. Back to his boats, back to his nets. Peter's from a town called Capernaum on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. He was a fisherman. That was his business that he left to follow Jesus. In a sense, Peter has gone back to what he knew. He's gone back to who he was before he failed Jesus, before Jesus called him. I have a couple images here of the Sea of Galilee. We tend to think of it as a sea, but it's not. It's maybe three times the size of, of Lake Geneva. This is Pastor Brian and Lorene and my wife and I on our trip to Israel. You can see in the distance there, that's the Golan Heights in the distance, and we're aboard a boat on the Sea of Galilee. The next picture here is uh, me. Brian, it was freezing cold one morning, and Brian dared me to run in the Sea of Galilee, and I did. So let's make that picture go away quickly. <laughs> These men had gone back to their hometown, back to their business, back to what they knew, back to being fishermen. Now remember, it was in the context of a miraculous catch of fish and fishing that Jesus first called Peter, James, and John. In Luke chapter 5, in fact, there's a powerful connection between what's happening here and what happened there. Let's go to Luke chapter 5, read verses 4 through 11. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out in the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing, but at your word I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. 
And they came and filled both boats, so they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on, you'll be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. This is a remarkable passage, and it connects, you can see Jesus, in a very real sense, is recreating for Peter and the disciples the moment of the, when he first called them. Fishing and a miraculous catch. In both cases, they'd fished all night and caught nothing. In the first account, I, I can't help thinking, if I'm Peter, and Jesus, after fishing all night, says, let down your nets, and he's like, look, uh, you might know religious stuff and spiritual stuff, I'll grant you that, you know more than I do about that stuff, Jesus, but I know fish, it's what I do. But because you're Jesus, I guess I'll have to say yes and let down the nets, you know. And a miraculous catch, and it's so shocking to him. What's his reaction? What's Peter's reaction? Go away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. He struck this is not an ordinary rabbi. This is no earthly sage. This is no messenger. This is God in my presence. And he's struck when you face God with his own sinfulness, his own unworthiness. So here in John 21, Jesus is in a sense bringing Peter back to that place, reminding him of his own unworthiness. Jesus actually knows more than we do about everything, not just spiritual things, even fishing. The way Jesus says it to them is even kind of funny to me. He says, children, don't you have any fish? Now, the word children in Greek is the word paideia. It means like where we get our word pediatrics. It means little ones. And so it's, but it's, it's like a colloquial slang. It'd be like saying lads or boys, catch anything? So he's on the shore and he, he knows they haven't. And he calls out. They don't know who it is. Hey, boys. Catch anything? There's something else in these stories. When Jesus recognizes, when Peter sees the miraculous catch in the first story in Luke 5, he's struck by his sinfulness and says, go away from me, Lord. How does he respond to the miraculous catch in John 21 story? Differently, doesn't he? Jumps in the water, splashing his way to shore to see Jesus. I think Jesus is bringing these, him back to that place. We call this facing your failure. And most of you know the story. I won't recount it for time's sake here, but Peter, all the disciples fell away. Jesus said they would. But Peter's betrayal was particularly painful. Three times denied even knowing Jesus. Facing your failure. There is no restoration or healing for Peter or for us unless we're going to face it. A Christian counselor friend of mine said, he uses this line often, and I think it's true, the only way out is through. The only way out of your pain and suffering and difficulty and guilt and shame is through it. We'd like to circumvent it, wouldn't we? I'd like to jump right over here to grace and forgiveness and mercy and know that he loves me. And Jesus wants to bring us to that place of restoration, but the only way over here is through your pain, through your shame, through your failure. If not, we're in danger of what Dietrich Bonhoeffer in his book, The Cost of Discipleship, called cheap grace. Grace with no edge or teeth. Grace, grace with no ability to transform. He writes, costly grace is the gospel which must be sought, the grace that cost our Lord everything, and the door at which we must continually knock. So Peter desperately wants to see Jesus but he also knows his betrayal. And Jesus is going to bring him to that place. Recreating the scene of his great failure and shame. You know, the story of Peter's denial was in the courtyard of the high priest. Some of you will know that story. It happened around a charcoal fire. Servant of the high priest in the court recognized him. Soldiers recognized him. And they accused him of being with the Galilean, Jesus. And three times around that fire in that courtyard, Peter said, I don't even know him. I don't know him. What's waiting on the beach when Peter splashes his way to shore? 
charcoal fire. Fish and bread and a charcoal fire. Jesus is recreating the scene of Peter's first call and the scene of his great failure. We've all got that place in our heart. If I ask you the question, what are you most proud of? What's your best moment in life? I'm guessing your mind would go to a birth of children or grandchildren or married wedding day or something like that. Maybe Cubs winning the World Series. Hopefully not. Your best moment. What if I asked you what's your worst moment? What's the worst moment? Your worst moment. Your greatest failure. You wouldn't want to say it out loud, but I'm guessing you know. The thing at which you... You struggle deep down. You know intellectually God forgives, but you struggle deep down to know, could he really forgive this? Or could you forgive yourself for it? That's the place Jesus wants to meet Peter, and he wants to meet us. The only way out is through, friends. There's no restoration and forgiveness and healing and hope and new life unless we come to that place first. Let's read verses 15 through 17 and see how Jesus addresses this with Peter. When they'd finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. And he said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved. Because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. There's so much going on here. Now you might be tempted to think, Jesus is really kind of twisting the knife there, isn't he? I mean, why three times he asked this question? He gets the same answer. It's like he's just trying to make Peter squirm. He's really twisting that knife. And I would say, yes, he is twisting the knife. But it's the knife of a surgeon, not a thief. Jesus Jesus is doing spiritual surgery on Peter's heart. And it is painful. But Proverbs tells us that wounds of a friend can be trusted and that Jesus is the friend who sticks closer than a brother. He's doing something that is for Peter's good. Three questions for three denials. Three commands for three betrayals. This is answering the question. The question Jesus asks is, do you love me? It's a simple but profound question. It's essentially the great commandment. When Jesus was asked, what's the greatest commandment in all the Bible? He says, to love the Lord your God. He quotes Deuteronomy 6, with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. And the second is like unto it, to love your neighbor as yourself. Notice in the first question Jesus asked, do you love me more than these? What are the these? It's a good question. What's these? Well, let's think about the scene for a minute. Peter is on the shore around a fire with the other disciples. It's not incidental, by the way, that they're within earshot of this conversation. And when Jesus says, do you love me more than these, perhaps, I think there's several things going on, and one of them could be that Jesus is saying, do you love me more than these fish and nets and ropes and boats? Why that? Well, Peter has gone back to who he was before Jesus called him. And I think Jesus could be saying to Peter, do you love me more than your old identity? Do you love me more than your career goals? Do you love me more than your ambitions and agendas and desires for your life? I've been a lot of people who would say they believe in God and even they they would use the words they love Jesus, but if you cut them open, what they really love is their career, their achievement, their plans. So it's possible, and I think perhaps even likely, that one of the things Jesus is saying is, do you love me more than these things you've gone back to? Are you willing to leave them again and follow me? But one thing Jesus is absolutely doing is bringing Peter back to some of the things that Peter said before the crucifixion. In Matthew 26, there's this story, a part of the story where Jesus it's, the, it's after they've had the Last Supper and they're about to go out to the Mount of Olives and Jesus will be betrayed. And Jesus says, the Son of Man is going to be betrayed in the hands of sinful men and be crucified. 
and all of you will fall away, Jesus says. You know what Peter says? He says, that's a bummer. No, he doesn't say that. Peter says, Lord, even if all of these fall away, I will not. Here's what he says. Jesus, I've been hanging out with these 11 and you, and I could see that these guys might fall away, but I won't. What did Jesus change Simon's name to? Peter, Petros, Rock. He's saying, you can count on Rocky. I'm not going to leave you. I'll never deny you. I mean, these guys, okay, maybe, but not me. I think what Jesus is absolutely doing is saying, not just do you love me more than these nets and boats and fish in your old life, but do you, are you going to make bold promises again, Peter? Are you going to say you love me more than these others love me? Now, the rest of the disciples were not all that great either. But at least they weren't dumb enough to say that stuff out loud that Peter said. <laughs> Peter was not the guy that, he was not the disciple who thought things through. I mean, he, he's the first one out of the boat in one story. He walks on the water for a few steps. He's also the guy, when Jesus predicts his death, says, Jesus, stop saying that stuff. It's bad for morale. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. So Peter was, not, he was a man of action, impulsive. John was the thoughtful one. And in fact, there's some interesting interplay between John and Peter. In John's gospel, there's some competition going on. John, in the resurrection story, makes it clear that the, the one that Jesus loved ran faster to the tomb. I don't know why John felt the need to tell you he's faster than Peter, but he does. And again, here. And in fact, Nathaniel is mentioned in there. You know the Nathaniel story when Jesus called him? Jesus says to him, I saw you under the fig tree. Now, we don't know what was going on under the fig tree, but whatever it was, Nathaniel thought nobody else knew. And he's, when Jesus says, I saw you under the fig tree, Nathaniel goes, my Lord and my God. He's quick to believe. Then there's Thomas in the boat. Thomas is the opposite. He's incredulous. He's the one who says, I will not believe unless you give me hard evidence. So Jesus is not only reconciling Peter back to himself, he's reconciling these men back together to each other. No more big promises for Peter. No more boasting about what you're going to do. Just one question, a profound question, a question Jesus puts to each of us. Do you love me? What a question that is. How easy to say yes without thinking it through. I have a friend who's a, God has redeemed his life through the AA program, 12-step program. He talks about when, before he was in recovery, how he would be out for a couple days at a time and really making horrible, destructive choices. And he would come home after drinking. And he would look at his children sleeping in their beds and he would feel deep emotion for them. He called it love. But later after he had gotten sober, he said, I realized I wasn't loving them. I felt sentimental about them, but I was not loving them because I was not laying aside my desires to put their good first, which is what love is. Jesus is not asking, do you feel emotional about me, Peter? Do you feel sentimental about me, Peter? Saying, do you love me more than these? This is the first and greatest command. This is the question given to us. I wonder this. If you were having breakfast with Jesus, there's not a beach nearby here, but, you know, just imagine it. Over a fire, how great would that be? And if Jesus looked across the fire to you, and ask you, do you love me more than these? What would the these be for your life? If Jesus looked across the table or the fire to you and said, do you love me more than these? What would it be? What would he be asking you? Family, children, career, health, what would it be? Each time Jesus asks this question, he follows it up with a command, the same command three times, feed my sheep. By the way, this whole thing echoes the first and greatest and second command, doesn't it? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Do you love me? Love your neighbor as yourself. Feed my sheep. Jesus is bringing Peter back to that original call. Taking care of sheep is hard work. Sheep are dumb and smelly 
And you can't, like, you know, put them in a pasture and, and, and play on your iPhone while they graze. You've got to watch them all the time. They're constantly wandering off. They require constant attention. It's exhausting taking care of sheep. And Jesus says to Peter, feed my sheep, meaning the ones I bring to you, not the ones you might otherwise choose to love. Will you feed and take care of and tend the ones that I love and that I bring into your life, Peter? It's really very tender what Jesus is doing here for Peter. He's restoring him. His restoration is taking place at the very point of his great failure and shame. And I've thought about this for years in my life. And The place Jesus wants to do the greatest work in your life is the place you least want to talk about with him. The place of your great pain and great failure and great shame. I mean, I, I, I think we're all like this. I want to talk about forgiveness and grace and purpose, Jesus, but I don't really want to go over here. I'd much rather have you deal with me over here where I have my act somewhat together. And Jesus is saying, the place that I want to do my greatest work in you is the place you least want me to go, but that's the place we need to go if I'm really going to restore you, if I'm really going to heal you. In American culture, it's certainly true now, but I think it's always been true, we tend to associate leadership with power, with strength, with confidence. We don't handle it well when leaders fail. But Jesus seems to have a different agenda for those he's going to use to build his kingdom. He seems to be interested in brokenness and humility, selflessness and repentance. Those aren't qualities we, we use on the campaign trail in American culture. But they're the, exactly the kind of qualities Jesus is looking for in all of us. He's not interested in people who think they have it all together. He wants people humble and broken enough to know they don't. Those are the people he can put back together in his image and use for his glory. Let's look at verses 18 through 22, how this this amazing little passage wraps up. Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young and you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted, But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands, and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved. That's John referring to himself again. John's funny. Following them, the one who also had leaned back against him during supper and said, Lord, who is it that's going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? And Jesus said to him, If it's my will that he should remain until I come, what's that to you? You follow me. This is a fascinating and weird little ending to this story. It's kind of a cryptic passage. First, did you notice two times Jesus repeats the original call, Follow me. That's the first call he ever heard. I'll make you fishers of men. Follow me. Jesus is restoring Peter back to that call. Restored to the call. He's telling Peter that you're not going to be call the shots in your life, Peter. This whole business about when you were young, you went where you wanted, dressed how you wanted, but when you're old, you're going to be led where you don't want to go. That's Jesus telling Peter, if you're going to follow me, you're not in charge. If you're going to follow me, you don't call the shots. If you're going to follow me, it's going to mean going places you would not otherwise choose. And then he says, stretch out your hands stuff, right? What's that about? Well, we know from history that Peter was, was executed, crucified actually, upside down, legend tells us, by Emperor Nero in about 65 AD. History, not biblical accounts, but historical accounts tell us that Peter felt unworthy to be crucified in the same manner as Jesus and so requested to be crucified upside down. Stretch out your hands. Jesus said that to indicate the kind of death he would die, but I think he's also implying something else about the life Peter would live, and he calls us to live. How do you give someone a hug? Show me with your hands. Come on in, right? right? Can you hug someone like this? No. Well, once they're inside, maybe, right? But no, you can't. This is a defensive posture. You can protect yourself this way, but you can't love someone this way. Stretch out your hands, Jesus says to Peter. Stretch them out. It's a vulnerable position. 
you could get punched, you could get hurt, you could get wounded. You can't protect yourself very well with your arms stretched out like this. I think Jesus is saying to Peter, when he says, follow me, feed my sheep, and stretch out your hands, those are all linked. To follow him is to love the people he puts around you. And how do you love them like this? You can't. You love them like this. How did the good shepherd love us? He stretched out his hands. So he calls us to do the same. That's what he's saying here to to Peter. C.S. Lewis writes in his book, The Four Loves, to love it all is to make yourself vulnerable. Love anyone, and your heart will be wrung and possibly broken. You can't love if you're in a defensive posture. He's saying, Peter, you're going to build your life on the pattern of my death. Jesus is the good shepherd who stretched out his hands for us. So he calls us to stretch out our hands for his sheep. And so in verse 18, Jesus basically says, Peter, you're going to die for me. You're not going to be in charge of your life. It's going to be harder than you think, and eventually you'll die for me. And in verse 22, what does Peter say? Okay, what about him? <laughs> Which I think is so funny. Like there's the old Peter again. Uh-huh, uh-huh. What about that guy, Lord? What about that guy? Why, did, why does John include this? Why is God included for us? You know, in John's gospel, he says, if all that were said and done by Jesus was written down, there wouldn't be enough books in all the libraries of the world to contain it. So this is in here for a reason. And I think it's more obvious than we like to think. I think we all have that. Jesus says, you must follow me. And we say, okay, what about her? What about him? What about those people? Jesus says, what is that to you? You must follow me. Yeah, 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 I know, but what about them? But she's not, but he... Jesus says, you must follow me. This reminds me of the Narnian Chronicle book, The Horse and His Boy, by C.S. Lewis's book, The Horse and His Boy. Anybody read that? If you haven't, go home, pick it up. It's fantastic. In The Horse and His Boy, Aslan is speaking to a a Calamine noblewoman named Avarice, who's asking about a slave girl that she's come to love, but previously she despised or didn't think much of. And she asks Aslan, what's going to happen to her? And Aslan says to her, child, I'm telling you your story. Nobody gets to know anyone's story but their own. He's echoing Jesus here. How often do we cease or fail to follow Jesus because we're worried about what somebody else is doing? I'm worried about somebody else's life, somebody else's gifts, somebody else's issues. Not to say you shouldn't care about other people, but Jesus says, Peter, you must follow me. Don't worry about what someone else is doing. You follow me. This is the question, friends. Peter asked Jesus, do you love me? And Peter says, you know I love you. You know all things. Yes, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. And the third time, do you love me? And Peter says, what I want to say with my heart, Lord, you know everything. And you know I'm not perfect, but as best I can, I love you. And Jesus says, feed my sheep, take care of my lambs, watch over the people I care about. He doesn't just say that to Peter, who would become the leader of the church. He says to every one of those who, of us who want to follow him. He asks us this morning, do you love me? And if your answer is in your deepest part of your heart, yes, Lord, best I can, I love you. Jesus says, with love in his eyes to you, then love the people I put around you. Love the people that come into your life. Stretch out your hands to them as I stretched out my hands for you. Let's pray. Father God, it's one thing for us to talk about love and to say that we love you. But you've made it clear to us in your word, love is not sentiment or feeling. Love is acting selflessly for the good of another, regardless of how we feel. And we see that in you, Lord Jesus, who stretched out your hands for us. When we were yet sinners, you died for us. You seek us as lost sheep to rescue us and to bring you into your fold. And then you call us to stretch out our hands for your sheep all around us. Thank you, Lord Jesus, our good shepherd. We pray in your name. Amen.